what a fantastic couple of days. It's just been so moving, actually, to all be together, to have these conversations, these crackling panels and ideas shared in the hallway. It's been really amazing to all be together again. And I'm so grateful to all of you that took the plunge to join us here. And now we get to finish with this amazing event. And it is such an honor. Uh, for me tonight to get to introduce our keynote speaker. First, I did want to say thank you specifically to someone who I know is going to watch this H France recording but is not here now, and that's Alyssa Seppenwall. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she's on our program committee. She did so much important work to make this the conference that it was, uh, particularly in organizing this keynote. And unfortunately, she couldn't be with us, though she very much hoped to be. So Alyssa, I know you'll be watching this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. We wish you could be here. So when we developed the theme for this conference, Mam Fatou Niang was brought up by Alyssa immediately as a crucial voice in French and Francophone studies who we needed to have with us at this meeting. Mam Fatou Niang is a scholar, a filmmaker, and photographer whose work examines and sits at the intersection of blackness in contemporary France, black African diaspora, film studies, gender studies, urban planning, race, commemoration, and increasingly decommemoration. She holds degrees from the Université Lyon de Antoine in Anglophone Studies and Urban Planning and earned her doctorate from Louisiana State University in French and Francophone Studies. She is currently an Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Carnegie Mellon University and she's the author of the book Identité Française, Bonleur, Femininité et Universalisme that came out with Brill in 2019. Christina Horvath, in her review of this book in French Studies, wrote that Nyang combine de manière inédite les approches de chercheurs, de cinéastes et d'activistes. Il réussit le tour de force de faire résonner les voix de Marianne Noir dans le débat universitaire, dont elle reste encore trop souvent exclue. Just last month, Mama Fatou published a new book, Universalisme, with co-author Julien Sodo, part of Anamosa's collection, Le Moe Febla, and it is available for sale just outside at the wonderful price of just $10. She is currently working on a second manuscript, tentatively titled Mosaica Nigra, Blackness in 21st Century France. She is a member of the Governing Council of the Western Society for French History and has been awarded an Advancing Black Arts Grant by the Heinz Endowments and the Pittsburgh Foundation for her project, the Black Invisibilities Project, as well as a Berkman Faculty Development Fund from Carnegie Mellon for a multimedia project on Black France. She is currently, in addition to her position at Carnegie Mellon, the visiting Melodia E. Jones Endowed Chair of French Studies in the Department of Romance Languages and Literature at the University at Buffalo. A chair, just by the way, previously held by André Moroy, Michel Foucault, Roland Barthes, Gilles Deleuze, Jacques Derrida, and Hélène Sixou. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nyong is also an accomplished photographer, having co-authored a photo series on black French Islam. And of course, she's also a filmmaker. In 2015, she co-directed Marianne Noir, Mosaïque Afropéenne, with Katie Nielsen. The film follows seven Afro-French women as they investigate the pieces of their mosaic identities and unravel what it means to be black and French and to be black in France. The courses that she's taught sound amazing, and I want to take all of them. One called The New Paris, Post-Terror Impacts on the City of Light. Another, Growing Up Black or Asian in Contemporary France. Another, from the 1889 Paris Exposition to Charlie Hebdo, Cross-Cultural Encounters in French Society. And Cities and Suburban Spaces in French and Francophone Literature. Mam Fatou is also a committed public intellectual, taking her work outside the academy through collaborations with magazines like Slate, Jacobin, and many news outlets in France. If you've not read it yet, I commend to you her essay, Fighting Racism is What Makes Us Universalists, published in Jacobin in fall 2020 on France's summer of racial reckoning following the murder of George Floyd. 
She and her co-author, Julien Sodeau, were also responsible in 2019 for bringing attention to the racist murals in the Assemblée Nationale and starting a petition for their removal that garnered international attention. It is an unbelievable honor and joy for me to welcome Mam Fatun Young here this evening to our keynote lecture of our 67th annual meeting of the Society of French Historical Studies. French, but not quite, right? Expanding Frenchness for the 21st century. Please join me in offering a warm welcome of Mam Fatun Young. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh my God. Um, whew. Merci beaucoup. Um, so, I'm really happy to be here with you um, today. And I wanted to say un vraiment un grand, grand, grand merci for you, for being here, to you, for being here. You could be outside enjoying the warm weather. And um, um, un grand merci à Patricia. She's been so patient with, you know, I'm notoriously bad with emails and she's been so patient. And also you mentioned Alisa Sepinwall. I know she's listening. We love you, Alisa. Christine Haynes and the members of the program committee for extending this invitation and um, for putting together this wonderful event. Uh, my talk today is entitled French but not quite expanding French for the 21st century. I was looking at the conference and I attended um, one or two panels between an 18 hours sleep um, craze that happened. I just landed from Senegal yesterday. And the, the ethique du dérangement, you know, ethique of trembling, moving things, shaking things out, that I advocate for in my work, this moving away from one's comfort zone is deeply weaved into your program. From wanting to deepen our understanding of conversations and initiatives around DEI and move out of the check the box, right? To expand beyond traditional academic circles around, around l'hexagon and universities. To expanding, to no, uh, thus excluding knowledge producers from community colleges, high schools and members of the community at large. Literally hybrid in its format, we are both here and in the metaverse. Your program showcases a robust will to reach beyond your society and collaborate with other associations. I'm mainly thinking um, about the presence of colleagues from Haitian Studies Association and French Colonial Historical Society. And I see these crossings, ces traversées, as humanities, I'm talking here about the set of disciplines, and humanity, as in us, inhabitants and occupants of a planet that we are rendering more and more inhospitable. I see these crossings, this art of listening and of hearing, this humility to peek across pipelines and sedimented habits, this thinking of this set of disposition as key to our future, if we are to have one, both as scholars and as humans. This talk is dedicated to my maternal grandmother, Aminata J, a a woman who did not know how to read or write, but someone who rocked her world and ours. Born in Rouen, in the Department of Loire in 1925, she belonged to the fifth generation of women who ensured that our family in the Aubeaujolais would keep a vibrant sense of Saint Louis du Sénégal, our home before metropolitan France. I owe her my earliest understanding of my situation growing up in France, metropolitan France, as a seventh generation citizen constantly surrounded by a question that followed me like a second skin, d'où viens-tu? I also dedicate this talk to Tyler Stovall, with whom we had planned to have dinner tonight. Well, tonight we will have a drink, not just for you, Tyler, but with you, as I believe that those who are no longer with us in flesh are still with us. As Senegalese poet Biragujo beautifully wrote, those who are dead are not gone. They are in the darkness that grows lighter. The dead are not down in the earth. They are in the trembling of the trees, in the water that runs. The dead are not dead. I finally dedicate this talk to our students, to our children, to those who are coming after us, those whose survival and futures force us to learn quickly how to become and be human together. How to restore humanity, how to see reason as a shared human faculty towards repairing and caring for life in, contra in contrast with the forces of death that are smothering us. I wanted to share with you a letter that I wrote a few weeks ago for an application. I hesitated a bit about sharing it publicly for a keynote lecture. 
then I realized that one, it said a lot about someone who's dealing with me today. And two, its content is at the very heart of our gathering today. I speak here of how I met Tyler Stovall and how decisive this meeting had been for the career shift that I took in 2006. I met Tyler Stovall shortly, shortly after the 2005 fall riots in France by way of a friend, Samba Ducouré, and of Trika Kitten. We were a group of French students, incredulous that such an esteemed American academic found it worthy to work in places like Bobigny, places that were synonymous with filth, contagion, and danger for France. As Tyler was revered by French academics, we felt like the respect given to his research rehabilitated these places where we were born, places that were routinely shamed in French public discourse. His scholarship made us, young Arab and black French, proud. Another aspect was how easily it was to approach him. I come from a French tradition where walls are extremely high between professors and students. It was absolutely magic magical to see a professor of his stature ditch lunch with French university officials for a walk or a cafe with us. He made us feel seen. He made us feel important. Because he looked like us, even though he came from mythical America, we thought that maybe one day we could become him. He asked us questions about our future, our work, and highlighted the need for us to travel. Tyler Stovall was instrumental in my decision to attend my French University study abroad program in the US. As a working class student from a poor neighborhood in Lyon, everything about this project seems out of reach. From the 1000 francs, 150 euros, of the dossier de candidature, to the thousands in bank guarantee required by the American Embassy in Paris to deliver a visa to workers at the university study abroad programs who believe that, and I'm quoting, American universities are not very fond of black and Maghrebi students, end quote. I had my very first class at Brown University on August 28, 2006. At the end of that very first session on African literatures, Dr. Tricia Rose addressed our little group of French exchange students. We're glad that you're here, and we'd love to hear you on French thought and Fanon. We rapidly glanced at the syllabus and nodded in agreement, not having a single clue who Fanon was. <laughs> I, like many of my companions, was a product of the Classe Préparatoire Littéraire, a two-year rigorous academic program that acquainted students with canonical figures of French humanities. Yet, the name Fanon was unknown. Over the next week, I read Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Edward Brothway, but I also read for the first time Emile Césaire, Franz Fanon, Marie Scondé, Asia Djebar, Edouard Glissant, Robert Hort, names that I had never heard of in France. I was the school girl who regularly scored first prize in French history from primary school to high school, and yet I heard of Toussaint and of the Haitian Revolution for the first time. At Brown, I learned that my country abolished slavery in 1794, light years away from 1848, the year that the Education Nationale had religiously drilled in my head. I learned of solitude, of the Bumidon, of Charre 44, and of the fight for liberation in the French Caribbean. I learned of Sarge Bartman, the 19th century black feminist who was paraded around freak shows in London and Paris before her brain, skeleton, and sex organ remained on display in the Paris Museum until 1974. I discovered that pillars of the French Enlightenment, of the Revolution of 1789, and of our revered Third Republic, great names who crafted our Republican traditions and universalist values, were also fierce anti-abolitionists advocating the inferiority of subjects of the French Empire based on racial prejudice. In the first months of that program, Lyon II's Dr. Claudette Fillard and Tyler advised me to apply to doctoral programs in the US. With their guidance, I started the process. They also helped me navigate the tracks of my university, who at the time considered that I had defected by remaining in the United States to engage in the shameful American craze of ethnic studies. My time at Brown had been illuminating, exciting, intriguing. It has also set the tone of my vision as an educator for the next 15 years and grounded my research around pivotal questions. How? How was it possible? How was it possible that French canonical humanities left so many of these names, dates, and events behind? How did that erasure affect the making of France as well as its contemporary fabric? And silencing this past to follow Michel Wolf Trouillot, 
how do we reconcile French modernity in all its contradictions and limitations in a bid to ultimately propose a reading of France that remains true to its present as well as the past that crafted Frenchness and French society? Without proper mentoring, what were my chance to fall into the world of academia and believe that it could be mine? The sign of the letter. I dropped and broke my favorite cereal ball around Christmas Day 2021. Fall of 21, also a bit of the summer, had been an unbelievably heavy time of loss, seeing the sudden transition of a handful of friends that for some I had just spoken to a few hours, days or weeks before that, prior to their departure. In the first days of 2022, I recreated the bowl using the Japanese art of kintsugi. Also called kintsukuroi, kintsugi is a technique for repairing porcelain or ceramic object using urushi, a lacquer mixed with gold. The repair object draws its strength, beauty, and value precisely from the very fact of having been repaired and from the golden curves that weld the old, that weld the old fractures by sublimating them. Kintsugi is not just about piecing together broken objects and covering the fracture with gold. Ceramic, you know it if you, I mean, if you play a little bit with it, is a living object. And you want here to reach some type of symbi symbiosis between the ceramic and the gold, like an organ transplant, transplant wanting to reduce the rejection of the graft. It is based on wabi-sabi, the acceptance of imperfection and of the natural cycle of life, birth, growth, decadence, death, as well as the possible transformation that lie within these voids, fractures, cracks and silences. This bowl, once broken during a time of loss and death, is still serving breakfast. Death, life and the living are prominently featured in this talk. I talk about absence, about silences, about ghosts. I talk about remnants, about how the silenced, the erased, and the dead become visible once we learn how to unsee and see differently. I talk about voices and forces that fill us with rhythm, breath, respiration. I talk about words, research, and actions that insufflate vitality and a concern for the living where forces of silence, death, and erasure have historically operated. I'm currently working on universalism as it is understood, packaged, and transmitted in France. I reflect on French identity, on its many components, on its history, and because it's my specialty, I focus on the place that race and ethnicity occupy in the articulation of a set of questions such as, who is French? How is our national memory constructed? What is the impact? of the his, this historical shaping, you know, of the historical shaping of the national narrative on very contemporary processes of integration or exclusion from the national community. How do we acquire, process, and spread the words that say inclusion or inclusion? I work at Carnegie Mellon, a university known for being at the forefront of new technologies, the first in the world to be completely covered by wireless networks since 1994, and home since the early 50s of Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, the fathers of artificial intelligence. Immersed in this environment for about 10 years now, it is almost naturally that my work on citizenship, race, and blackness in France was enriched by interrogation around human-machine interfaces, man-machine interaction, the ethics of AI, and the impact of these new technologies on humanity. Last May, walking, while working on a deserted campus, I saw odd-looking, odd -looking, four-legged, headless creatures running on a quad. Next to them, a small group of students had gathered around consoles and screens. It took me some time to understand what I was looking at. These were not headless dogs, they were robots. I engaged a discussion with the groups. I engaged a discussion with the group. The conversation was dizzying. Their enthusiasm was hard to contain as they were elated to share with one of the very few black faculty on campus the role that these strange creatures could play in establishing a word without racism. Words were pouring, racing out of their mouths. AI, e-dogs loaded with data collected from hundreds of law enforcement officers across the US. Drastic reduction, elimination of police violence and fatal encounters due to racist biases. 
facial recognition and facilitation of human flows at a global scale. And note that here they want to talk about controls of human flow, they're talking about facilitation. I headed to my office trying to di digest what I had just seen, this excitement, the unwavering certainty of doing something great for humanity. In class, it was um, Espace de la France du XXIe siècle, Spaces of France of the 21st century. The first article of our weekly press review was going to bring me back on earth in a rather brutal manner. The title? Le ministre de l'Éducation nationale, Jean-Michel Blanquer, part en guerre contre l'écriture inclusive, fustigeant au passage le wokisme, cette doctrine dangereuse à laquelle la France et sa jeunesse doivent échapper. France's <laughs> Ministry of National Education going on a crusade against um, the pronoun them, yell. The contrast between these two episodes was abysmal almost painful, between on the one hand the immensity of the world projected by these students, the interrogation raised by the, these modalities which were going, which actually are already radically transforming of our ways of being, our ways of managing humans and non-humans, our ways of interacting with and of inhabiting the earth, our futures, and on the other end the narrowness the provincialism of a crusade led from the top of the French state, a crusade against the pronoun, yell, sign of damnation and mass destruction of a whole civilization. I'm very cautious with the use of words such as never before seen, expressions such as never before seen, unprecedented, etc. But, and this is something that I've said before, in the years that I've worked on blackness, race, and racism in France, I had never seen, I've never seen anything like the wave that swept through the country following the death of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020. Hundreds of thousands mobilized all over France, the biggest anti-racism movement in contemporary history. And like many others, I felt for a moment that we were riding the big one, the gigantic wave that will take down the Republican Dam, that barrier that often contained works on race and memory. Well, the hope was short-lived, very short-lived, as the backlash was swift. It started, this started an important political sequence with President Macron accusing, in June 2020, university campus, campuses and social scientists of being secessionist, of breaking the republic in two, of ethnicizing social issues, even of turning this entire noise into a business and of making quick bucks out of luring young people in the street by selling them false hope. We also think of uh, Minister of Higher Education, uh, Frédéric Vidal, who called for an official inquest into what she called the dictatorships of minorities, activism, anti-French and anti-white sentiments on French campuses, as well as the ravages of leftist Islamism, Islamo Islamogoshism, on French campuses. In their world, the Republic, Frenchness, universalism, and free speech were seen as being under attack by gender and race-based, race-obsessed traders who were arbitrarily projecting onto French realities notions imported from abroad, mainly from the USA, and who were ready to cancel people who didn't agree with them. Well, today, like many of my fellow researchers, artists, and community members working both on the space that is France and on modalities of the living, and here I'm using Felwin Sarr's definition of le vivant, of the living, a definition that finds its roots in Senegalese cosmogonies. The living, according to Sarr, is that which strives by giving to and constantly taking from its environment. So relations, liaisons, flows, and the imperative to move when the immediate environment does not or cannot carry condition of life are a requisite. I find myself at the articulation of these two dimensions, you know, the desire to participate in a debilitating, debilitated French public debate without being trapped in its darkest, darkest, stinkiest, most time and energy consuming corners all the while speaking on issues that respond to the global emergencies that we, fight, that we face as living on Earth. And speak to these global issues from our interest and perspective, from our places of enunciation in race, religion, gender, class, etc. 
And here I use the word debilitating in its literal sense of something that impairs your strength, both physical and mental. And Audrey Celestine here present can share this you know, feeling of, hollow, of um, emptiness, of hollowness, of having been literally, you know, physically emptied out that you can have after a debate on French TV where the terms of the debate are so out there, so nonsensical uh, from beginning to end. You know, this is what Eric Fassin called l'air du n'importe quoi, that you feel that you've left, left a part of yourself on stage. I look at France from the USA, um, where I've lived for 17 years now, and I see a state, a country petrified by fear a country crippled in its ability to dream and determined to crush the dreams of those who are still projecting outside of accepting accepted norms. I see a country where the fragility of many of the foundations are exposed, the tension between Republican principles, principles and their reality as a lived experience. And unable and willing to face this contradiction, My country hides behind postures in a growing ethno-nationalist jargon where words are thrown around, emptied out, narrowed down to the point of losing their meanings. Cancel culture, Islamo-leftism, République, universalisme, woke. I write about this breakdown, about this refus d'imagination that today reads any curiosity or desire to expand or open oneself to new attitude as a sign of suicide français, French suicide, or of submission to borrow the Zemurian or Welbeckian paradigms of the great replacement. After Marianne Noir, I'm currently working, completing a second movie on memory. It's a piece that weaves together three examples of this atrophy of the imagination. La Nuit des Noirs in Dunkirk, the fresco of the National, l'Assemblée Nationale, and my take on uh, Napoleon's bicentenary last year. On May 5th, 2021, invited by Jean-Jacques Bourdin, historian Jean-Jacques Tula, Jean Tullard made a handful of ear-popping comments, but one in particular caught my attention. Okay, okay. we're missing something, it's okay. But one in particular caught my attention. Um, this is what he said. The first abolition of slavery did considerable harm to the economy. It is urgent to resuscitate the colonial economy. We need sugar. We need coffee. There's only one solution. It is a pragmatic one. Slavery needs to be restored. Nobody disputes this at the time. Only Abbé Grégoire pouted a bit. End of quote. <laughs> Eight years after the abolition of 1794, Napoleon reinstates slavery, and according to Tullard, who adds that, quotes, one should not judge the past with the values, words, and eyes of the present, end quote, nobody at the time contests the decision. I stopped at that word, person, nobody. Nobody, like the freed former enslaved, faced with a return to enslavement after eight years of freedom, nobody, like Louis Delgresse, who in his vibrant Appel à l'Univers called out the true traitors, those like Napoleon who betrayed the ideals, values, and promises of the revolution. Surrounded by the French army after an intense standoff, Delgresse and his men would blow themselves up at the foot of La Souffrière, preferring this death as free men to the indignity of slavery. Nobody, like Suzanne Belair, Sanité, Marie Rostoto, and the thousands of anonymous former slaves free men and women, and future re-enslaved, who would take up arms against the troop of General Leclerc, Napoleon's brother-in-law. This is what Leclerc wrote about these men, women, and children who refused to be enslaved again. We must destroy all mountain Negroes, men and women, keep only children under the age of 12, destroy half of those living in the plain and not leave in the colony a single colored man who had worn the epaulette. Without this, the colony will never be at peace, and at the beginning of each year, especially after murderous seasons like this, you will have a civil war which will compromise the possession of the country. Person, nobody. This word, person, loudly breaks many silences of our manicured history. How can one be such a vital actor in, in history and ends up as nothing, nobody, in memory? 
And here I'm using the word vital, vital, as Tullard himself referenced it, something that is the engine, the heart, the breath that has to be insufflated in order to resuscitate a dying organism. Who speaks for these nobodies? What happens to their facts, to their words? Who ensures that their voices ever come out of the non-pages of history where they are kept by prescribers like Tullard, molders and guardians of a narrative? The erasure of contentious episode was deemed necessary for the creation of a coherent collective identity and the narrative that sustained this identity. Following Michelet, his, dis his disciples like Pierre Nora, Le Goff, or Brodel worked to map out the elements which explained and sustained the personality of France. In the Lieu de Mémoire, an immense collaborative project in seven volumes, Pierre Nora compiles the history of France seen through the inventory of places and symbols in which the collective heritage is crystallized. The masterful work examines in census as diverse as Jean d'Arc, Descartes, the national currency, the French language, and in the initial volumes of 66 essays retracing Republican place of memory, only one contribution refers to the country's colonial history. It is an entry by Charles Robert Ageron, chronicling the lavish 1931 Paris colonial exhibition and the wealth of the empire. And I invite you, if you haven't done so, to read the masterful piece, Postcolonial Realms of Memory, um, that just came out last year, and that's a beautiful response to you know, the, the, the fact that the lieu de mémoire made the colonial and you know, anything that is not hexagonal French a non-lieu de mémoire. Um, just thinking also about Michelet, uh, we should note that one of his seminal work, L'Histoire de la Révolution Française, generously gives 14 lines out of seven volumes to the revolts of the slaves of Saint-Domingue presented in the work um, as the most appealing and barbaric event, event ever seen, 14 lines. So this approach sheds light on the erasure in France, in the politics of self, in the assembly of our national personality, of the colonial and of the notion of race, a notion that had been central to the elaboration of European modernity. We live in a country, I live, I'm from a country, officially blind to color, while silences around the racial questions haunt our daily lives. These silences are naturalized in the media, in the worlds of arts and academic research, in our very language. We're still battling and finding and trying to find a word to say blackness, noirité, noirceur, etc. On the questions of amnesia, I think of the discursive construction of slavery or segregation long posed as American institution instead of their French history. And yet, between 1525 and 1866, the accepted duration of the transatlantic slave trade, an estimated 12.5 million Africans were sent to the New World. 10.7 will survive the Middle Passage, the voyage to North America, the Caribbean, and South America. Of these 10.7 million, between 400 and 600,000 disembarked in North America. 1.6 million were sent to the Sugar Islands, the French West Indies. I often ask my students, both in France and in the US, why is it easier for us to associate slavery with cotton from Alabama rather than with canes from the West Indies? Educate, in France, educated to the horrors of Jim Crow and the civil right movements. We know Martin Luther King. Most of us have been, chances are that you've been in a primary school named Martin Luther King or played in a square called Rosa Parks, right? But how many French school children or even, even adults have ever heard of Solitude, of Toussaint? How many knows that Haiti, um, know that Haiti was a French colony? And I can even think here of, um, you know, former president Jacques Chirac who famously stated that, I quote him here, Haiti was not per se a French colony, but rather a place with whom France shared a common language. We wonder how that happened. <laughs> and, and a failed country that France have long helped and assisted as part of his humanitarian mission, end quote. I'm working with two examples to illustrate the ways in which this voluntary amnesia and narrow definition of national narrative reduced to its hexagonal manifestation in turn feed the ever-shrinking contemporary definition of Frenchness and violently oppose current initiative aimed at expanding the latter. So this is La Nuit des Noirs, a carnival in the northern French port of Dunkirk. 
It's a three week long event that see locals around 10,000 revelers for the last edition, dressed up and parading you know, through the streets in costumes with some choosing to wear black makeup and clothing to resemble African tribal figures and cannibals. Um, you can see the poster for La Nuit des Noirs, the Night of the Blacks, and it's a fundraising tradition dating back 54 years now. And it features three men in blackface with bright red lips and feather <coughs> red dresses. Invoking l'esprit de Charlie Hebdo, freedom of expression and the right to caricature, the city's local mayor, who's a left winger, Patrice Vergrit, defend this blackface when voices rose to denounce. Um, I think the issue started with the 2018 edition. He defended blackface and the use of blackface in this manifestation as a freedom to laugh and to have fun together, adding that the outfits were satirical and meant to be caricature. In 2018, he was quoted in Le Monde saying that carnival is the license to change your life, to celebrate difference, to change skin color, conditions, or job. And those who defended the festival and its use of blackface found legitimacy in time, the carnival had been around for 50 years, in the affection and intimacy cultivated between residents of the town, in pride, in a sense of moral superiority, brought by the philanthropic nature of the event. The, the benefits um, of the event were given to um, like fishermen's wives, widows, and people who had disappeared at sea. And they also pointed to the silence of the Caribbean associations in Dunkirk, who, I quote the mayor, never felt, never said that they were offended. And, um, and he was also quoted saying that the carnival of the Dunkirk is the truest expression of the, the republic. It's liberté, because for three weeks, people are free to roam the streets and do what they want to a certain extent. Egalité, because under the call, um, you didn't know who was rich, poor, who was you know, a worker, CEO, and fraternité because of this you know, intense brotherhood and uh, people knowing that they are putting money on, in for widows. And then he ends up with what is really the killer, and after this there is no more debate, Je, I'm Charlie, Dunkirk is Charlie. And one thing that was also extremely interesting during this time, and especially in 2008, which was the kind of the hate of um, the, the carnival being a attacked, or you know, especially uh, black associations from Paris, from Paris going to Dunkirk to um, kind of you know, complain about the event, was the pedagogy that the, the French media deployed around the event. It was extremely interesting that most of the pieces that came at the time were explaining to people what blackface is, but um, by using the American example. So blackface is a bad thing that was used in the 19th century menstrual shows in the United States and it's you know theatrical makeup. So it was very clear in the way it was explained that blackface is tied to you know America and uh, lynching and Jim Crow. It's bad, but it's sanitize the minute it crosses the Atlantic and in France it's liberté, égalité, fraternité. So really to me this this really um especially during, with the research that I was doing at the time, to, trying to find um, a way to indigenize blackface, not just by finding a French words that, so to, to me the issue was not just about translating the French word, but see if we have something similar in France. And using um, the help of my, of my colleague Noemi Minjai, um, extraordinary working on early modern theater, race in early modern theater, I was able to find a document showing the use of blackface, and it's exactly in the same permit as that it would be in the US, and the word is barbouillage. So parallel to that research, the, the, really the way the innocence of the activity was um, kind of hammered in the media and the disconnection between uh, you know, the, the underlying um, use of the, the, the racial undertones in, that were apparent in the US and the, disappearing, the, the, the disappearance of, of that in France made it clear for me that we needed to you know, really work on anchoring um, these manifestations in their French history, not just in the language, but in their French history. And this need appeared more apparent in, two, in April 2019 when I, oh, this is my friend Chula. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
appeared all the more apparent when I, when I met, um, I came across this mural while um, projecting my film at the French National Assembly. I'm just going to show it for two seconds and because it makes me sick. Um, when I came across this mural, it belongs to um, the Painted History of the National Assembly, a series of frescoes commissioned by the government in 1991, 31 years ago, from French painter Hervé de Rosa. So these characters stood for black emancipations on the wall of one of the French Republic's highest institution, its National Assembly, the House of the People. So after um, my me and my colleague Julien Ciudo raised a simple question in a petition, is this mural the best artwork to commemorate abolition of slavery? Right here, this is what it is. Oh, sorry. We were told that this is the artist style, which is not true. I was able, um, using the Ancong um, software, to and going onto the artist's main stage on Artsburg, um, made a summary count with my students. It took us a semester of 4,328 4, pieces of work, and we found that he had 26 different ways of drawing mouth, 62 different ways of drawing. Um, lips, um, 23 different ways of drawing nose, 18 different ways of drawing eyes, which left him with literally an infinite amount of combination to not come up with this for a work commemorating the abolition of slavery in a country where you can count monuments on slavery or abolition on one hand, on the fingers one hand. So after raising the simple question, is this mural the best artwork to commemorate abolition slavery, who were told that this is his style, black people naturally have big lips. We were ignorant, incapable of seeing the piece for what it was, a fun attempt at caricature, a piece of irony in the purest French tradition. We were told that the walls of the Palais Bourbon are like kryptonite to racism. Anything that is racist can't come in. We were told that race doesn't exist in a country, so racism cannot exist, and we are the racist because we work with race. We were told that the artists had worked with Africans in Africa and with Caribbean artists in, the, in Miami. We were told that we were Ayatollahs issuing a fatwa against the artist Hervé de Rosa and citing Voltaire, Charlie Hebdo, the sacredness of art. Our detractors argued that this fresco was art and as such was free to shock. Then we repeatedly heard that people never learned in school that these signs were harmful. All of this are from Le Figaro, Le Monde, L'Express, it's very, very France Culture, etc. It's very easy to find them on Google. Uh, the Minister of Culture, several art people, deputies, etc. Then we were told that people never learned in school that these signs were harmful, the big eyes, big lips. The last part for a moment was the most puzzling to me. You know, the general apathy in France around the fresco, as people were largely unwilling, unable, to read it as offending and blatantly racist. That to me spoke volume about the flaws, actually not the flaws, the success of our Republican ecosystem in erasing these signs from our collective memory. The point has never been to accuse the artist of racism or to analyze his intent while creating the piece. The petition was raised in order to denounce the blind angles of French culture, blind angles that allow such a work anchored in a racist imaginary to be created, brought to the National Assembly in 1981, hanged on the walls for 30 years. And to me, the Führer that engulfs our initiative ironically highlighted many of the very issues that we raised in our petition. I've just submitted an article entitled Les Trois Graces du Racisme à la Française, Innocence, Ignorance, and Arrogance, et Arrogance, The Three Graces of French Racism, Innocence, Ignorance, and Arrogance. An article in which I analyze three common stances toward anti-racism in the French context of memory and identity. And I almost wrote it in a week, um, the week that I had to take off to hide in Guadeloupe, not hide, rest in Guadeloupe after the whole fresco thing got a physically dangerous. I define innocence as the childish state in which France keep its, keeps its citizen through the Éducation Nationale and a plethora of institutions aimed at reinforcing the narrative of Frenchness as a single item that cannot be hyphenated. Ignorance is the willful and active process of maintaining that innocence when the Republican myth is challenged. 
And I see arrogance as a remnant of the civilizing mission, a reaction that unfolds in a myriad of attitudes, ranging from flat-out denial of racism in the country to the reversing of the stigma and claims of a French model and the mortal siege. It's the knee-jerk reaction when I tell people to keep quiet and listen. Listen not to what is being said, but to what is left out. What and who is forgotten? Why? When? And what does this silence say about inequalities, the inequalities of power? Elements such as the public reaction to our petition are ways of coping out, of trying to impose narratives or excuses that have never made sense and that are more and more being openly called out and rejected. I would like to speak here about the great disper disturbance, le grand dérangement, carried out today by voices often rising from the, peri from the periphery, the peripheries. Voices that push friends to rethink, reinvent the modalities of its presence to the world, to open up to the world, but above all to learn how to listen and hear the world, to have the humility to come out of oneself, to look at the ways others have thought about the conservation and transmission of life in all its forms. Voices are rising to question Republican principles frozen in, in the enlighten, Enlightenment paradigm, including a pseudo-universalism whose main functions is, are to obscure the European history of racism, deny its persistence in the contemporary world, and keep a tight hand on the production of national narrative, especially in France. We are accused of attacking the integrity of a nation, of putting universalism in danger, but as Julien Ciudo and I argue in our short essay, Universalism, universalism is a horizon that the Republic is yet to reach, an ideal that had been crippled by abhorrent exceptions, from late access to rights for women, to the institution and the re-establishment of slavery, to the Code de l'Indigena, Vichy, etc. Voices are rising to bring friends to rethink a, a we, new, and I'm thinking here about the beautiful film recently released by Alice Drope. A we relieved of its hexagonal contractures. A we that imagines itself be beyond the narrow lens of Le Trésor de TF1 and its eternal France, industrious and white, that of the village fleuri, the, their quenche, and their foire à la saucisse. To imagine a France that also think of itself from its colonized overseas departments and its banlieues, a France that think of the world no longer from above and within the universalizing gesture of its civilizing mission, but in and from the languages of its neighbors. In my current work, I'm thinking about the place that a more visible, more felt vulnerability and humility can play as a solution. Plagued by the disease of Amazonism and Oceanism, way more than that of Islamism. The French rural world is slowly dying, accentuating the loss of connection with the land, with the emotions, gestures, and resources, and all the complex structures in place to produce food and community. From the Champs-Élysées in Paris, to the Indre, to Eure, yellow vests are confronted with the brutal bites of sticks and flashballs, long reserved to ensla enslaved and colonized bodies from Saint-Domingue to the banlieue of the 21st century. In French academia, researchers and their labs are branded as Islamo-Gauchistes, defectors, traitors to the nation, but we should not forget that this treatment had long been applied to brown and black researchers, to scholars working on issues of gender and religion, in the relative indeffer indifference of a silent majority, a treatment that derailed many careers and forced others to leave France. I'm one of them. White bodies are openly experiencing some levels of state violence, so far reserved for per to peripheral spaces. And here lies perhaps one of the keys to a truly um, universal experience of humanity, through the experience of vulnerability. And again, I'm not implying that to have been called a wokeist on Twitter is akin to the daily experience and the barrage of online abuse that an Asa Traoré or Mabula Sumauro can go through. But there is a little door that had been opened here. I cannot not mention this, but the Russo-Ukrainian war is shedding crude lights on the methods of identification and compassion, compassion towards Ukrainian refugees to be welcomed in France. A compassion also driven by the fear of a war at the gates of home. A compassion that we can praise while contrasting it with the rejection of migrants from Africa and the Middle East. 
Of course, the idea is not that both groups should receive the same inhuman treatment or that Ukrainian families should be blocked, left out of Gare de l'Est, blocked at the border in Calais, but truly that their treatment should set a new precedent for the treatment of displaced groups. To be black within the European modernist narrative is to live on the French of official narratives that often exist in the dead angles, in dead angles and silences. It also means that we are never alone. We are constantly surrounded by, the, by silences of history. My body of work, writing, film, photo, is a sonarchaeology of sounds and silences, both in writings and in our lived environment. I investigate the means that we, black people, have developed to domesticate and harness those silences. And for example, this is what, what we do when we push against the rhetoric of surprise around the current climate. While many seem lost or struck by the novelty of the event, we've lived with these silences and this violence. And through this companionship, we've acquired a sense of a longer history of the present and a different sense of temporality, one that is not linear, but circular, one in which the rotation of times of time inevitably, inevitably unearths skeletons and hidden secrets. For the majority, humility and listening are the first steps to take, to take on these threats. Learn how to listen and hear those who have already been there, those who have often been displaced, contained, repressed. Learn how to acquire the humility to open up to their knowledge and ways of crossing the world, ways so far widely considered to be vectors of contamination, replacement, and danger. What can be learned from people who've long engaged into, into these practices? In academic circles, it needs to be done in a manner that unsettles accepted genealogies of thought without recreating the extractivist relations of domination or erasure of activist, indigenous, or non-white scholars. And I think here of um, Orton Spiller's pornotrope that someone like um, Selamawit Terefe beautifully expanded by applying it to decolonial feminism as a um, as a theory and potential political practice that erases the works, languages, and the materiality of blackness as it tries to denounce its subjugation. Modern France was born from blackness, said Howard French. It thrives by hiding, smothering, swath of the French experience with blackness, erasing it from the constitution of its national identity, from the way Frenchness was molded and solidified in history books, in school programs, in street names, in statues, and museums. Looking at France, I think of Michel Rolf Trouillot's unthinkable, this almost impossibility to come to terms with history, not as one wanted it to have happened, but how, with how it actually happened, and is parallel with Gilroy's postcolonial melancholia, the loss the mourning that grips my country today, this confrontation between the history that we have written, told about ourselves, and what we really are, or what we are in the process of becoming. I look at the ways in which this melancholy translates into fear and bouts of destruction, destruction of self, but also destruction of bodies like mine that bring France back to a reality it's trying to escape. These encounters with death are countered today by the vitality of citizens' movement, which naturally realize these, the, these junctions between the local and the global, between the human, the vegetal, the mineral, and the various forms contain, of life contained on Earth. This philosophy of relation in the French, of, in the French sense of relater, to tell a story, and mettre en relation, is at the heart of co-creation projects bringing together artists, researchers, and residents from Grigny to Fort de France to the villages of the Beaujolais. It is reflected in the action of anti-chlordecone activists in Guadeloupe, in the work of William Acker on the pollution of areas reserved to the so-called Jean du Voyage. It is in the philosophy, this philosophy is the cornerstone of month-long mobilization of housekeeping staff taking on hotel giants, Ibis, the RATP, or the SNCF. It guides the first step of the very young cooperative of Uber drivers in San Sandy, an initiative which aims to impose a more virtuous social, ecological, and economic model in contrast with the excesses of the ride-sharing companies model. This souffle, respiration, structures the works of Yala Kisukidi, of Audrey Celestine, of Mabula Sumaoro, works for scientificity, are contested, can be contested in France. 
It drops under the pen of Dali Misha Touré, Ayasi Soko, Tassadi Timash, Kauta Rashi, who are often not seen as French writers. It vibrates in the cinema of Alice Job, of Josa Anjembe, and Naomi Lemal. It inhabits the choreographies of Bintou Dembele and the theater of Eva Dumbia. To hear this myriad of voices, to learn to see this mosaic of experience as French, is to literally universalize, universalize, i.e. to consider the infinitely great of France through the infinity of atoms from around the world that constitute, renew, and constantly transform at random from their interactions. This expanded France is not to be conceived. The seed had been planted for a long time. It is the awareness and the general acceptance of its existence that is still lacking. Today, there's a generation in universities, on theatre stages, in the streets, that refuse to live under the yoke of an invisibilizing myth. Far from the separatist threat brandished by Macron, far from breaking the Republic in two and serving it on a platter to terrorists, the actions are planting seeds toward a new political utopia. And this is where my historian friends, because remember, I'm a literary scholar, right? And this is where my historian friends, this is where we need you. What is, what should be your role in this derangement that we see as the only condi condition for a true universal? Early in my doctoral year, I'm a Vantiemist, I realized that I was caught in an epistemological straitjacket as, as I was constantly running into barriers barriers in language, or lack of language, to talk about my subject. Barriers in the definition of knowledge and in the conventional wisdom around who could be seen as legitimate producer of knowledge. And barriers in the forms of institutional and research methods that were not fully covering my investigation. From that, I began framing my production, both text and images, around two questions. The first one being, what kind of French studies do, we, do I want for our times? Number two, how can I generate knowledge that address our world's grand challenges, populism, political rhetoric, inequality in its many forms, climate change, human machine interaction, etc. And I would like for you to keep this frame in mind. What kind of history do we want for the 21st century? How did you learn French history? In your particular century or area, what France did you learn about? What was left out? What could your area gain from shedding lights on those hidden corners? How are you, in your scholarship practices, but also in daily life as an academic citizen, subverting historical practices that silence minorized or defeated voice, voices, as well as the contemporary practices that make it hard to consider alternative routes? Were you trained to speak of to speak for, or to speak with, and speak from. And as this list grows longer, I can hear some thinking, yes, this is great, but that's a lot, right? <laughs> How can I balance all of these great things with work, you know, with my area of work and the hassles of life outside of academia? Well, in Plantation Memories, Grada Quilomba speaks of becoming subject. She argues that everyday racism is experienced as a violent shock that often places or projects black people in a colonial scene where they are, the exotic, the other, the subordinate, the angry black woman, we talked about this yesterday, the angry one, at any moment, at the turn of a sentence or with the inflection of a voice, past and present can collide, and the present is lived as if we were stuck in the past. So, and I think that we've touched on this a little bit yesterday during the lunch plenary. Being aware of these points is not optional for many of your colleagues, for your black colleagues, who cannot choose to turn some magical button on and off the switch, or choose when they want to engage on a particular question. This, having to deal with this check mark, is the lived, unchosen reality of many whether they work on race, as in my case, or they work in the biochemistry department. Jean Tullard's person, nobody. Mayor Fegritte's take on la vie des Noirs being the quintessence of the Republic, liberté, égalité, fraternité. And the public reaction to the Diros of Fresco are perfect illustrations of the circular logic of a country's self-defined notion of civilization. 
In her book, The Order Citizen, French philosopher Céliane Larcher analyzes the complex state thinking that enables citizenship and civil equality by virtue of the revolution to coexist with the derogatory legal regime applied to former slaves of the plantation colonies. As Larcher demonstrates, French citizenship was articulated with race in mind. And we are faced today with a system that very finely sculpted, tuned itself around the notions of identity, race, and our dehumanization and relegation through colonialism, slavery, and racism. But a system that, as Brazilian philosopher Jamila Ribeiro argues, is suddenly struck with a severe case of dumbness and a lack of theoretical sophistication when it comes to understanding black identity politics. In The Haitians, Jean Casimir writes that, quote, through, through its inexhaustible discourse of self-adulation, France congratulated itself for the reality it had created through its successful use of force, from which it derived its presumed monopoly of a knowledge itself. Yet, what is conceived of as an inevitable form of control over what it saw, what it saw masked the vitality and functioning of a multiplicity of, multiplicity of other realities. France was largely unable to understand these realities, or at least disdained and underestimated them. My question for you today is, how can you, in your area, in your line of work, shed light on these vital forces? Through bodies like mine, France is forced to, to face its coloniality and its history, forced to reopen pages long sealed. In order to think about our future, we'll have to talk about Haiti, Saint-Domingue, and Toussaint. We'll have to explain why France ratified two abolitions. We will have to talk about the colonies, talk about these young men and women called in from the four corners of the empire to participate in wars and rebuild a battered France. We'll have to unveil these individual stories and the way in which they crossed the great Roman national. We'll have to tell the stories of these young black and brown men stuck behind the Renault, Citroën, Citroën and Peugeot assembly lines. These young men sweeping our streets and later parked in the banlieues where the police national regularly harassed their descendants. We'll have to talk about this 13-year-old black girl visiting the, national, the Assemblée Nationale with her class, about her pain and her humiliation as her classmates scoffed at two grotesque figures commemorating the abolition of slavery. And I would like to end by bringing back this word by Senegalese poet Pirago Job. Those who are dead are not ever gone. Those who in the, they are in the darkness that grows lighter. The dead are not down in the earth. They are in the trembling of the trees, in the water that runs, the dead are not dead. The dead are only gone when they have been forgotten. It is our responsibility to shed more light on the darkness that threatens to engulf them, to keep the ground shaking and the water running, as to ensure that they are not covered for eternity by the stillness of silence and decay. Merci. for an incredible talk. This was really amazing. Um, 
you talk specifically about the pushback against your work that you have encountered in France, um, but I wonder if you could also just say a few words about the reaction to your work in the United States, um, which I'm sure has also not always been easy. But thank you very, very much for sharing it with us. It's fascinating and so important. Thank you. Oh, this is this is a this is a complex question. So um, I'm part of a generation of scholars who left France, um, and it's very specific. We are about you know it's around 40, 50 of us. And Jacqueline Couty, who spoke yesterday, is part of that group. I can also think of um, uh, Félix Germain, Grégory Pierrot. I mean, I'm not going to name them all because it's almost 50 who left France in the Sarkozy years, and we call ourselves the generation. Sarkozy or sock out. Remember, you know, Sarkozy saying la France on l'amour la kid and for me at the time the relationship was complicated, I left. Um, so we left because, and especially, I mean, we almost have the same stories, you know, class prépa, one semester of exchange uh, of a study abroad program or a year that ended up, you know, being a 15 um, or 16 year old stay, because it was really, I mean, the realization, we all have the same story, realizing that you can actually um, study race, you can study these places like the banlieue within French history, within French literature. We almost all have PhDs in French studies. Whereas in France, and you know, Audrey uh, might comment a little bit on that, one of the only way it was possible, at least in the um, mid-2000s, were true you know, political science or getting a degree in English or Anglophone studies studying race and you know in America studying African American you know the relationship of African Americans to the you know uh, the American Republic and then from there kind of marinage your way by using France right or the Caribbean and for me I was immediately appealed and actually also I was double majoring in um, Anglophone studies and architecture right so I was light years away from all of that but I always had this um, this attraction from the study of the banlieue and the US enabled me to study the creation of identity and the creation of exclusion in urban pra practice but in a department of French studies which was impossible in France at the time. And I'm saying this because to all of us the US offered um, means and generous financial means to do our research and I've noticed during my studies that this was often time at the expense of African American studies. And this is literally from the year one of my doctoral studies where, for example, I had a very generous fellowship that was um, created to attract more African American students. And it was on year 12 and I was the 12th black person, non-American to get it. So all of us were European or from the Caribbean. And this has been, you know, a kind of a fixture throughout my studies, getting fellowships or, I mean, the, in the past two years things have changed a little bit following George Floyd's death, but really the focus being that the U.S. will be more generous if you're looking at race or anti-blackness outside of the U.S., right? And it's the situation in France where it's easier when you're, when you're an American, African-American scholar working on... on so th that, that's very interesting and also um, being in the U.S. complicated a little bit my vision on race. Um, I have a anecdote that I have not shared a lot. Um, I just shared it last two years ago at the Nuit des Idées at the French Embassy in London um, where I shared the stage with my friend Alexis Peskin who's a vir visual artist. He actually made um, the, the picture that I showed at the beginning of my slides and it's at the cover of my first book. So Alexis, Alexis is huge, he's 6'10 and with a huge throw and I had invited him for a residency at Carnegie Mellon, a month long residency where he created a piece with my students and I was in my office grading. He was at the atelier working and I called just to check on him and then I you know, proposed to give him a lift at the hotel. It was around 11.30. And um, I had forgotten to um, signal left, signal you know, right when turning and all of a sudden three cops cars you know, came on me like flashlights. And the funny thing is that um, the cops who stopped us, you could see how um, nervous he was 
basically. Um, it was my first time being stopped in the US and when I moved to the US, I had a very fran bad French accent. I used to speak like this. <laughs> and I took accent reduction class. It didn't work too much, but <laughs> things are better than this, right? <laughs> and I was so scared that my French accent from Rowan came full force and you could just see the switch. He just said, oh, is that a French accent? So in that moment, we went from being black person on a campus with virtually no black people in a nice car at midnight with a giant black man in a fro, right, to being French. And for the next 15 minutes, we were subjected to the bonjour, I want to. Right? <laughs> so that also is something that, you know, that, that, I, that I've wanted to explore in new projects, how, what changes when people identify me as French and what are the circles where my Frenchness tramples or erases my blackness in America. And, um, and as far as the reception of my work, I can tell that that has been overwhelmingly positive in the US, both the film and, and the article, because it also brings people, you know, um, another perspective from what they knew of France, right? I oftentimes have students who take my first year class and they've had 10 years of French in high school and tell me that they never heard of the banlieue, right? They really come to us after 10 years in high school with this, Amélie Poulain slash Emily in Paris, right, <laughs> view, and not even knowing that there are black people in France, or, I mean, the colonies, who? And that says also a lot when we were talking yesterday about strategies, how we should think about this pipeline beyond the university, right? How we should be really in conversation with high school students, high school program makers, and I know that in the U.S. it's hard because you, we don't have this program like in France, but think about you know, how, how this modality should be thought of beyond or before we get students in, in universities. Also, what kind of students do we get, right? Why is it so hard for us to get black students in, in America? Why is it so hard to get students from minorities? What does it say about who can go in exchange program? And then in return, that feeds the lack of minority students that we have in doctoral program where the overwhelming majority of students from minority are coming from Europe and then we find ourselves replicating these uh, schemes where you know you can see at the MLA most of the students who are non-white will be from Europe or Africa and um, so these are I, mean, I know that's a lot of things to us but that your question was interesting as it also opened all these you know all the considerations so America good friends <laughs> I'm kidding <laughs> like that, you know, America 10 points, no, 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 it's not like that. I have also a very, you know, complicated relationship with, with, with America. I spend every time that I have in France, because France is home, even after 17 years. I mean, France is home. It's home. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think we're going to end there because it's after time, but um, please help me thank Montana.